Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let's get started. Now, those are my disclosures as before. Now, one thing we can stay, state with confidence is that there is no ideal ASD device uh, available at the moment. And as a result, developments of devices and the modifications have continued. You may remember that back in 1976, Terry King and Noel Mills implanted the first uh, ASD device, and that was a fairly complex, large profile device. And then subsequently, there were attempts at using the, uh, the Rushkin double umbrella device for very small ASDs. Uh, that led to the development of the lock clamshell device, which subsequently became CardioSeal. Uh, around <clears throat> the same time, the Sidris button device was developed and used. And then a major step forward was back in 1997 when the Amplatzer atrial septal defect device was uh, developed and brought into uh, clinical use. So this led to development of a few other devices, and I'll touch on, on those. Uh, one of the devices was the Oclitec Figula occluder, and these are pictures of the PFO occluders, the Amplatzer PFO occluder and the Oclitec Figula PFO occluder. The major difference between the two is not the shape and the night and all, uh, but the lack of... Uh, uh, lack of a left atrial hub, and therefore possibly reducing thrombogenic tendencies. Um, now when you look at all these devices, which have a fairly similar shape to uh, the uh, Amplatzer, there's not much difference in appearance, as you can see here on transesophageal 2D echocardiograms, as well as the 3D appearances. They're all uh, fairly similar in concept and design. So why do we need to develop different devices? Well, there are possible uh, uh, reasons such as complications associated with different devices, possibility of residual shunts, nickel release, and erosions. And I'm not going to touch all of them, but here's a study uh, from uh, Frankfurt um, Krumsdorf's uh, paper back in 2004. Um, and there was an incidence of thrombus formation with various devices, different devices. And here's a picture of a thrombus uh, on the incompletely endothelialized uh, atrial septal defect device. And in this list of complications, you see a variety of devices around that late 90s, early 2000 era, where pretty much all of the devices have some complications related to them. And uh, that was a fairly comprehensive uh, use in Frankfurt of a uh, all the devices, Rashkin device, the Sidris button device, the Astos, Angel Wings, CardioSeal, Starflex, Amplatzer, PFO Star, and the Helix. In another study um, uh, from Kerler in um, Kiefer in 2011, uh, the incidence of procedural complications was around 3%, and that included a stroke and development of femoral pseudoaneurysms, uh, transient atrial fibrillation, small pericardial effusion, but more importantly, with uh, these various devices, there was an incidence of residual shunts uh, six months after implantation. And although the largest number of devices used were the Amplatz and the Cardia, uh, others, Starflex, Figula, Oclitec, Premier, and Helix were used as well. And in this, you see uh, a residual shunt distribution with all of the different devices. But what was clear was that over a period of... Uh, one year to two, three year follow up, the vast majority of these residual shunts close. So, residual shunts may or may not be an adequate argument for development of devices. <clears throat> what are the other uh, developments? Well, as I said, the Amplatz ASD device was uh, developed and uh, brought into clinical use in 1997, and everybody knows the concept. There's a polyester fabric filling the waist and the discs. Sizes available from 4 to 40 millimeters. And then about six years later, the Heart R device was developed. And you can see the similarities of the design uh, to the Amplatzer. And 2005, the Oclitec device was developed. Again, you can see the uh, similarities of design, apart from the lack of a left atrial hub, uh, which then means there's less thrombogenic material in the left atrium. The sizes available were 6 to 36 millimeters. And one of the arguments was the biocompatibility risk. Here, uh, there's an attempt to demonstrate possible nickel skin allergy. Well, is nickel allergy or nickel release a big issue? Uh, in uh, this paper, 
uh, in uh, oh, quite a few years ago now, uh, there was nickel levels measured uh, from, uh, was, I can't remember the center in Germany, uh, but nickel levels were measured after implantation of the Amplatzer occluder. And you see within 24 hours, there's a jump in the nickel levels, rising up to a peak around a month, and then gradually over a three-month period, the nickel level uh, reducing towards normal. So that was one of the arguments about, uh, well, uh, let's de develop a device uh, which has a low level of nickel release and less leaching. So uh, on this uh, bottom left picture here, there's the cocoon device, and you see that nickel levels actually remain static or uh, plateaued uh, from pre to post uh, uh, after the implantation of cocoon device. And the CIRA study, uh, CIRA device rather, in an animal study showed that if the device was uncoated, there was a, uh, a rise in nickel level a, few, a day or so after implantation, whereas the coated device did not have that jump of nickel release. So nickel release was the, one of the factors that led to development of different devices. So cocoon device, for example, available in similar sizes to the Amplatzer, it's a nano-platinum coated uh, nitinol wires, uh, and um, so th that uh, helped to reduce the nickel levels. The CIRA is a tin-coated uh, 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 nickel uh, nitinol wires, Sizes available are between 8 and 42 millimeters. And the Figula Flex, available up to 40 millimeters now, with a ball and socket delivery system allowing flexibility. So flexibility of the device at the time of attachment and alignment with the septum became a different argument to develop another device. Then there was another device called, um, apart from the Figula Flex, the Night Occlude ASDR device that's been developed more recently, which is made of single wire. There is no hub at all. Uh, it, there's a friction attachment point and a safety wire, and that's available in sizes up to 30 millimeters. Uh, and the, uh, this safety wire may help with the uh, pulmonary venous approach to deployment, and it has a very low flat uh, profile. Now, flexibility of attachment uh, was another reason for developing the CIRA Flex, which is a next generation of the CIRA device, and that came into practice a couple of years ago. Uh, there is no central point of attachment on the left side, but there is a suture or loops uh, on the central point of the right atrial disc, and that allows it to be uh, flexible. And then there's the Gore septal occluder, the new generation that is available, and this is really predominantly for PFOs, but also ASDs of small to medium size of less than uh, 16 to 18 millimeters. Uh, and again, uh, this has become uh, much easier to use. The Atriocept device, which has now been modified to the Ultracept, was a similar sort of uh, design, six arm double umbrella nitinol frame with PVA umbrellas. It is retrievable and repositionable. It has a self-centering mechanism uh, based on these threads. Uh, the, uh, the total arm length is 14 millimeters larger than the uh, central uh, ring diameter. This is available or was available up to 34 millimeters diameter. And if you can see on the left atrial side, there is no exposed metal on the left atrial side of the device. And that has become uh, useful uh, as well in its own way. Now, one of the difficult areas, in, especially in older patients, is those defects with pulmonary hypertension where the pulmonary, vascular, pulmonary artery pressure is raised but the pulmonary vascular resistance is not so high as to become Eisenmenger syndrome. And it's difficulty in knowing how to deal with those patients. Well, you can do all sorts of uh, working out whether to use balloon occlusion, 100% oxygen, nitric oxide to assess a reversibility or whether to leave those patients alone, but it's the development of the fenestrator device which helps in those, some of those cases where there is a residual left to right shunting and right to left shunting allowed through the fenestration until such time as uh, that shunting is no longer required. So you can either make a handmade pushing a dilator, large dilator through the edges of the, uh, the two discs or, as in this case, the uh, um, Oclitec, where they actually manufacture a device with a fenestration already created, rather than shoving a dilator through uh, the patch and the nitinol. 
and a, a paper about five years ago, but these were all uh, handmade fenestrations uh, from Brook uh, on 15 patients with pulmonary hypertension. The fenestration was created between 5 and 8 millimeters. Uh, the uh, pulmonary artery systolic pressure was 58 millimeters mercury mean and similar post uh, device closure. And these fenestrations eventually closed up spontaneously, uh, bec bec largely because they were handmade, whereas the uh, manufactured fenestrations tend to stay open. The other issue that has uh, led to a lot of development uh, investigations as well as arguments uh, about development of softer devices is the erosion, and I'm not going to deal with that. I think complications talk will come later. But there were two patients reported from Brisbane uh, in 2009. One was a 39-year-old with a 15-millimeter AST closed with a 20-millimeter Amplatz or septal occluder. And two weeks later, uh, erosion occurred. And at, at surgery, uh, this was dealt with by surgery, device perforation of the right atrial free wall as, a, as well as the rupture of non-coronary sinus of the aortic root was noted. And here are some pictures highlighting uh, some of those um, uh, issues. Here, the uh, atrial roof, as well as the uh, aortic root uh, erosion. And um, another patient was a 54-year-old with a PFO, uh, which was closed with not an oversized device. It was a 2518 Amplatz of PFO device. And 18 months later, erosion occurred. And at surgery, device perforation of the atrial wall anteriorly as well as posteriorly was noted uh, and the device was explanted. And you can see here uh, the, um, the pictures from that paper. So uh, this was, has raised um, a lot of questions about uh, various studies into erosion. This was a, an Amplatzer device uh, that eroded six years after placement in a 46-year-old gentleman. It was a, not even a big device. It was a 14 millimeter uh, ASD device uh, to close a PFO. And here, in, uh, in an operative photograph, you see a hole there with erosion. And so that has been one of the concerns, in, and we, uh, people have been looking at the reasons for erosion. And some of the factors that have been noted in erosions are deficient aortic rim or anterosuperior rim, oversized devices, malalignment of septum and abrasion forces that you can uh, see in a uh, cartoon drawing here. And the location of erosions uh, have been posterior wall of the right or the left atrium and the atrial junction uh, with the aorta. And um, one of the key problems in erosions is uh, highlighted here. If you have a device placed here, there is the transverse sinus and sometimes the device presses on the transverse sinus, erodes into that, and even if it does not erode into the aorta, there will be bleeding externally from that atrium. And on this side, this picture is highlighted by Taiji Akagi, where he talks about malalignment of the atrial septum. Normally, you would see the atrial septum here, but in this patient, the atrial septum is here, and uh, his view is that if there is malalignment of the atrial septum, then that might predispose to erosions in due course. But the problem is we do not understand the mechanisms of erosions. There have been around 97 erosions worldwide. This is data from uh, St. Jude Medical now. 48 of those were in U.S. and 49 outside of USA. Um, 40% of the cases were pediatric, the rest being adult, 70% female, and around 75% of them involved device sizes more than 18 millimeters. Interestingly, 88% of the erosions occurred within first year of implantation, but then subsequently about 12% er erosions occurred anywhere up to beyond three years after device implantation. And so uh, this has remained a little bit of a concern uh, because um, various experts have tried to uh, pin down the reason for erosion, and those are oversizing and deficient um, anterosuperior or the aortic rims. Well, that has been observed relationship, but we know that the vast majority, 80% of uh, cases, may have deficient aortic rims. Uh, and we know also that there is a slight tendency to oversizing and in the majority of cases around the world. And if those were ap important factors, then we, would, we ought to be seeing a lot more erosions than uh, we do currently. So it's not entirely clear. Statistically, at any rate, 
40% of all erosions occurred due to oversized devices, and 90% of all erosions occurred uh, because of deficient um, anterosuperior rims. And so um, uh, this is an, a, a sort of sensitive area in terms of uh, how to proceed because uh, St. Jude Medical tried to change the uh, instruction for use uh, and put down absent aortic rims as a contraindication, whereas now, uh, more recently, because of a lot of discussions, that has been changed. Uh, but uh, erosions is one of the areas that um, will continue to cause a few problems. Uh, we do not have enough data on other devices. Currently, FDA has put down as a warning uh, for retroaortic rim deficiency rather than a contraindication. They've recommended to St. Jude Medical that there should be records of all implanted devices. The, they've recommended working with the American Society of Echocardiography to develop guidelines for device implantation and follow-up. I'm not sure how uh, that can be developed, really, because the practice is pretty well established. Obviously, uh, important to notify all patients of potential erosions. Uh, they recommend transthoracic echo within a week from implant, but we know that erosions do not necessarily occur within that first week. They can occur anywhere for, uh, later than that, although a majority occur in the first year. They re recommended writing a letter to all the cardiologists to warn them of, of this. Now, so that is an erosion issue, and that we can discuss later as to um, uh, how we need to deal with it. Future developments, there is a, a paper from Wai Wu from Shanghai uh, published three years ago of a Chinese lantern device, which is a biodegradable device made of uh, uh, PLLA and PLC. Uh, a device has a, a head and a waist and a tail, and I don't know if you can see it, but it's uh, very much like a, not quite, but similar to an Amplatzer device, uh, but biodegradable. Um, it's been implanted in three Yorkshire swine, and uh, it, in two it was successful. And at autopsy, or um, uh, one month later, the device was completely endothelialized. So this concept shows the, the feasibility of uh, biodegradable devices. There's another paper from a different unit in Shanghai from Yu Feng Zhu, uh, published a couple of years ago, and this device is fully biodegradable. It has a self-expanding double disc device, and again, it's very similar to all the other devices that are non-biodegradable. Uh, it's made from similar biodegradable material, polydioxanone suture and PLLA and polyglycolic acid. Uh, then uh, there are two tantalum markers uh, on each side of the discs, and eight, 18 dogs had ASDs created, and the ASDs were closed with these biodegradable devices. And um, uh, autopsies at various stages, at two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, up to 24 weeks, and then histology between eight weeks and 24 weeks showed that the polydioxanone had almost disappeared completely by 24 weeks, replaced by fibrous tissue. And so uh, this shows that the polydioxanone has excellent biocompatibility. There was surface endothelialization occurring uh, very early on, which reduces the risk of thrombus formation. There was a lining of endothelial cells by 12 weeks, and the rate of degradation was in parallel to the rate of tissue formation. So as the material degraded, tissue formed. And so uh, uh, the, the, uh, the concept has been shown to be feasible. The problem is that in the size of devices that we need, the larger devices, the, there is a technical problem in terms of uh, engineering uh, in, because the devices are likely to be too soft. But what this has shown is the start of possible biodegradable devices. And so polydioxanone has excellent uh, compatibility, but we will have this problem of uh, larger sizes when it comes to clinical use. So um, we don't understand fully the reasons for erosions. All the devices have a similar design and similar concept that we use apart from the Ultracept device. Uh, so uh, we don't know the incidence of erosions, but that is going to be a big issue. Uh, if the erosions can be abolished, then uh, device closure will become less controversial as far as the surgeons are concerned. We do need compliant rather than stiff devices. We will need biodegradable devices, and that will be the future. Uh, but currently, there is not enough commitment and incentive from industry to make these changes, and especially with biodegradable devices. I thank you very much for your attention.